So, um, so today, as as all lectures at the CBW, we have the Creative Commons license that Anne uh, talked about this morning. Um, it's a CC BY and um, and share alike. So, uh, like, yeah, basically, it's sort of a, a good way of explaining it. It's sort of viral in the sense that if you take a slide from this, your slide deck is infected. And then you have to then make your you have to share your stuff too, so that's the way you have to think about it. So, and you have to acknowledge where you got it from. In addition, I encourage tweeting cameras, pictures. I'll take selfies with anybody, I'm very Canadian that way. <laughs> and uh, we'll do that. So uh, this module is about databases and how sort of central they are to um, to the work we do. Um, in cancer genomics and cancer bioinformatics. It's uh, clear that um, a lot of things I'm going to talk to you about uh, today may be different next week, may, will be different next year, will we'll change, things evolve. Uh, some of the things will overlap with what some of the speakers have said this morning and will overlap with what some of the speakers the rest of the week are going to be saying. So repetition is a very useful academic educational tool and so we encourage it amongst our faculty. And so we'll, we'll be doing a lot of that. And of course, uh, this is only a one week workshop and so we can't cover everything and some of it you may find that we don't cover deep enough or, or with enough details and, and I encourage you to contact us or use some of the resources that Anne talked about this morning, Biostars and, and so forth. Uh, some disclaimer is I um, don't profit from anything I'm going to mention. For example, I do not have any stock in Amazon. Um, wish I did. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, so brands, products, or whatever that may mention, uh, so I don't, uh, for, I don't benefit from that. I used to work at NCBI m many years ago, and it's a company, company, institution, place I liked very much, and I, I very much encourage and support their products and I have over the years and I, I do, and I'm not sorry to do that. Likewise, I was an OICR employee in uh, Toronto for 10 years. I was associate director to, of in, informatics and biocomputing there and working with Lincoln Stein and a bunch of other uh, PIs, including uh, uh, Jared and Yuri that you're gonna see this week. And so uh, I'm gonna uh, talk about some of this stuff that people at OICR have done, and, and I, again, I'm very happy to do that. So, as I mentioned uh, this morning, I'm at Genome Quebec. I sort of, um, this move to Genome Quebec for those in the US uh, don't know the Genome Canada sort of uh, enterprise is uh, sort of like going to the other side. I'm sort of uh, now on the, uh, it's like going to work for the NIH sort of funding program when you used to be a scientist your whole life. And so now I'm on, so I'm a VP of Scientific Affairs, which means I'm, I'm a scientist. I'm still involved very much with the science that's going on. But we're, our activities is mostly in supporting scientists and helping scientists get money to do genomics and bioinformatics work. And so that's what I do at, uh, at, at Genome Quebec now. And I'm on Twitter, and I encourage you to follow me there. And that's the, also the Twitter handle for the bioinformatics workshops. So the objective of this module is just to... Uh, uh, review databases and some of them, some of the main, not all, of course, of the databases that are used in cancer genomics and cancer bioinformatics. And we're going to, after um, my lecture, we're going to talk about, or Anne is going to talk about some visualizing tools, and so I'll talk a little bit about that as well, and um, and how to get things, uh, the data you need, uh, you want to have access to, in. Um, in computational biology of cancer genomics. So why do we have bioinformatics? And the reason, the main reason is that we have open data in genomics and proteomics technologies. And so if we didn't have data, uh, we wouldn't need to have tools. And so because the data are sort of driving the tools and the tools and the data have been driven by the technology. So Illumina technology, sequencing technology, 
microscopy, all of these technologies generate data that have led to the development of tools that we have today and therefore the software that we need to access these tools. BLAST is a good example. How many of you use BLAST? Hopefully most of you. How many of you have heard of BLAST? <laughs> okay, so BLAST is a, is a, a sequence uh, searching tool. So you, you, you query with a sequence and you find similar sequence in databases. Um, but BLAST itself was invented because there was a need to search sequence, sequences and database, sequence database. And so the protein and gen bank databases, which are open, uh, open databases, led to the development of tools like BLAST. So if it wasn't for GenBank, BLAST would not have been invented. And actually, BLAST was invented at the same place where GenBank used to live at the NCBI. So th these are sort of things that sort of came uh, with each other. And many people in bioinformatics don't think of it that way, but bioinformatics is, is what we do in bioinformatics when we use software and we use databases. We're doing an experiment. We're testing a hypothesis. And so um, an example is you have a sequence, and so you need to, which are like your reagents, so you, you sort of things you do your query for in a database against. You do your method, which would, in this case would be BLAST, and so you do a BLAST search, and there's different very uh, types of BLAST. You can do protein against protein, nucleotide against protein, or protein against nucleotide, and, and um, those are various flavors of the same sort of BLAST algorithm, and then you get your results. And so you have to interpret your results. You have, uh, and this is in, in a bit where you do your hypothesis testing. And so you have to know your reagents, you have to know the tools and the methods, and you have to know, uh, you have to think about doing your controls. So for example, what's an example, or not an example. I'm asking you. I'm going to ask you a question now. Be ready. <laughs> What's an example of a control you can do in a BLAST search? So you know what controls are in, in a lab. So you know you... you... Sorry? So you could put a yeah, random nucleotide or random protein sequence and then you can search it. You don't, and there you don't expect to find anything, right? And sometimes you do find some things, and that's a little misleading. <laughs> and so, that, but that's a good control. So another control is would be of something where you know it's in the database, and you search for that specific protein, and you expect to find it, right? And if you don't find it, that means that maybe your parameters are wrong. Maybe your your, but it's, an, it's sort of an interesting. So things. So you should do controls for things that you expect to find and things you don't expect to find, and you should not find them. And if you find them when you're not supposed to, that's a... Anyway, so just the thinking of doing a comp... You know, when you do a computational experiment, you, you have to think of it a bit sort of... Some, those of you who are from a wet lab, sort of the same types of controls you can think about when you're doing... Uh, and this is for, goes for BLAST. It could be for any uh, of the many tools that we, we're going to talk about this week. So... In the big picture, which is, uh, I know I'm, I'm, bring, I'm starting you a square one here, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do that, is um, how do you define bioinformatics or computational biology? So this is going to be a think, uh, pair, share. So that means you're going to talk to the person next to you, and you actually chat for one minute, and you're going to write together one definition of what you think bioinformatics and or computational biology. And we could go into debates about bioinformatics and computational biology being different things or the same thing. In my books, they're the same thing. And so I don't, I don't want to go into that kind of definition. <laughs> <laughs> but how would you define computational biology? And talk to the person next to you. Pair up. Discuss. <laughs> and yeah, you have, to, you have to talk. You have to actually talk, yes. <laughs> and uh, write it down. <laughs> A short, doesn't have to be long. I'm not writing a, a book here. Just a short definition. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. 
And once you figure something out, write it down, just a few words. Yeah. And yes, I will be asking you your own application to analyze or interpret Are you want me in the picture? Well, maybe you want, you want the answer? You ready? <laughs> now you want the answer now? <laughs> okay, so does anybody have an answer? So how many people do we have in the room today? 40-ish? 26 plus 5, so 30, 30 some people. So we would have 30 answers, I would say. And so that's fine. 30 answers. You can have 30 right answers. So um, maybe ask you guys here. What's your answer? Uh, you said bioinformatics is using computation. Can you speak up? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we said bioinformatics is using computational and algorithmic methods to analyze biological data and systems. Very good. Anybody else? Yes, I'm looking at you. Um, well, we started out with data has been generated, and then we're going into modeling. You finish? I finished. Well, I was going to say, you're using how you're using computational uh, tools and methods to analyze uh, biological data. Yeah. Yeah. Good job. Um, <laughs> the use of computational methods to collect and analyze and interpret biological data that will help inform formulating that. Yeah. Similar to what they say, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, analysis of biological data by, on the computer. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, Did anybody have a different one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did everybody have something similar? What about this side? It must be a good one on this side. No? No good one? It's the same? same. Just the same. We have one. Oh, you have a different one over there? Okay, go. Yeah. Okay, so I'll show you my answer. So, my practice is about integrating biological themes together with the help of computer tools and biological databases. Not all of you have databases, very important databases. Uh, <laughs> and gaining new knowledge about the system and study. And so, this is a pretty broad definition and it involves a lot of things similar to yours, right? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> and, um, but it's really, it's the, it's the software, it's the databases, it's the thinking and getting new insights into biology. The other thing that's sort of in the back of uh, this bioinformatics definition is that it's really, even though we do a lot of, you know, IT, computer science, math, and blah, 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 what's driving the, the, the science here is the biology. So the biology, it's a biologically driven sort of activity. We're using computer tools to do biology. The same way chemists or biochemists use chemistry to do, understand biology and, and so forth. And so there's a concept of big data also. So that's an evolving, what I'm talking about today will be different next year. But at the top there is a forklift lifting a five megabyte hard drive into a plane. Um, wow. <laughs> so it's, but it's from 1956. And of course here, this is a five terabyte uh, drive that is, uh, sits next to, to my laptop. And that's from last year. You can get even bigger ones now, or smaller ones for the same, or more data. I actually, I mean, this is not, I'd say, 15, 16 years ago, I purchased a one terabyte hard drive for a data center at the cost of a quarter of a million dollars, 14, 14 years ago. So it's, uh, 
It's <laughs> things have evolved. <laughs> things have evolved, and they will continue to evolve. So, uh, this is related to a slide that uh, Mark had earlier today. It is the whole idea of of cloud computing and the size of data sets and what it means to you know move data from one data center to another data center. One of the reasons why it's going to become impractical to do so is that. It's going to take years now to move large data sets. And five petabytes is about the scale. It's a bit smaller than that, but it's the order of magnitude that the ICGC data set is in right now. So this is a so one between one and five petabytes. And so that kind of data size set is not going to be movable into a data center anymore. And if you want to have access to the whole data, whoops, the whole data set, and if you want to use, you want to be comprehensive, if you need the whole data set for the kind of questions you want to ask, then it's going to be impossible to, to one host and two to get because you're planning these. Uh, the uh, folks at Amazon, if you actually talk to them about moving large data sets like that, you, you tell them it's much easier, much faster just to ship the hard drives. And, and they say, and we're really good at shipping stuff. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so, uh, the if you have this in one place and you want it to move to another place, one is to physically move the data on an airplane is faster than you use the internet, or or to actually and what's what has become the solution now is to actually move your your software to where the data is and do the computes there, and that's what we're going to do this week, and we're going to do it in a couple of environments. So the first part of the week we're going to do that in Amazon, sort of commercial cloud. Uh, public commercial cloud provider, <laughs> Amazon Web Services. And in the second half of the week, we're going to do it at the Collaboratory, Cancer Genome Collaboratory, which is a resource at the University of Toronto uh, that's been set up by folks at the OICR. And so um, it's going to be, it's going to be, you'll see very different uh, access, somewhat different access, somewhat different, what's going to be the, the the difference, though, is which data set is where, and which data set is present on Amazon versus on on the collaboratory, and which tools are easily integratable and, and pipelines and so forth. And so you'll be playing with that this week, and you'll have a chance to, to study that, to see the, the differences. So what I just said, data sets are in the petabyte scale, if not exabyte, uh, pretty soon. And data and the security rules, the uh, things that um, Mark talked about, will be somewhere and not in your own hands. So basically, it's a lot easier to apply standard sort of rules for accessing the data around where the data is, as opposed to supporting those rules around your laptop. And, and, for, and you should not have any of this data on your laptop anyway, because it's, you know, stealable and, and not physically secure and so forth. And so not necessarily the data we're going to study this week. So this week is going to be, it's all going to be, we're going to talk about controlled access data, but the actual data you're going to be using is going to be open data because we didn't get you permissions to have access to controlled access data. But you'll see how to do that uh, in lecture today. So there's, we talk about openness. There's, there's all sorts of different things. So there's open Access usually refers to publications. There's open source, which usually refers to source code. Open data, which refers to data. And there are open courseware, um, which refers to the material that we teach with uh, here in this workshop. And so we talked about, so, so the bioinformatics reagent is databases. And um, the way this information is organized is sort of a key thing to understand what is, you know, usable for, for a given database. And, and it sounds a little crazy, but it's, if you put something in a database, you should be able to get it back out. Uh, there are, there, I've had experiences with large scale projects where we've put things in databases and then we can't find it anymore. And <laughs> it's, um, and it all has to do with, identifiers and the fields that the metadata and where things are at and if that's not kept track properly and the wrong identifier is put in the wrong field and then you go use your query engine which just looks for that metadata in a certain field but doesn't look in the other field then it doesn't find it 
And this has happened in large organizations, which will remain nameless because it's too embarrassing. But uh, it's some of the big players that are on this planet in the bioinformatics world. Uh, well, maybe if you give me a beer, I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, no, you don't buy me a beer. But if I have a beer. <laughs> um, so, obviously, once a database is, is well organized and well structured, and it sort of standardizes ways you can talk to it, then, uh, then you can write tools that will do that. So it's not just you doing hand queries through a web interface. You can do write API. So API's application programming interface allows you to talk from software to talk to your database and generate your own um, interface, your own website, your own data sets, and so forth. And so having that available is a really sort of key thing uh, to having uh, a, a good database. And a really sort of key thing uh, on, on organizing a database is what's your data model. And so here's an example of a uh, data model would be that whenever I change the DNA sequence in my DNA sequence database, I will modify a, the unique identifier for that sequence. Because the unique identifier for that sequence is, is X, Y, Z, the same as those three letters. And I change one nucleotide, and now to know that the system has changed, my data model says I will change the identifier for that because it's not the same sequence anymore, and therefore it has a new identifier. And so databases like Emble and GenBank have done that now. If they, it wasn't like that at the beginning, but now they have uh, identifiers that change whenever the sequence changes. And so that's part of the data model. Is, so you're gonna, whenever you change a sequence, are you going to change the date stamp on it? Yes, you know, we're going to do that. If you change a feature but don't change a sequence, do you change date stamp or the, the unique identifier for the sequence? All these rules that you put around a database is, is important to sort of define up front before, and you publish those ideally, or you at least put them on your website to explain to the people what these various fields mean, what uh, is the purpose of this database, what's being maintained, how frequently is it getting updated, and, and all of these things. And so those are key things in, in, in thinking about a database. And so, so just a few images to sort of explain some of the things I would think about. So the metadata, which is basically data about data, right, is um, you'd have things like create dates, update dates, uh, submitted ORCID. You know, does anybody know what ORCID is? Yeah, it's an identifier, which is unique for each researcher. Researcher, yeah. So it's uh, each of us, we all have an ORCID, an ORCID ID. Uh, if you don't know your ORCID ID, you should know your ORCID ID. If you don't know, you can go to the ORCID website and they can tell you what your ORCID ID is or you can register and have an ORCID ID. And that soon all journals will require that anyway. So when you submit a paper, uh, many of the journals, definitely the PLUS family does that and uh, the BMC, probably the, many of the open access journals. And ideally, this will percolate to, to things like uh, PubMed and so forth. Well, you'll be able to, to query by ORCID ID for a given investigator. So it'll be a lot better because there's some names you can imagine happen very frequently in the databases, but are represent different people. They just happen to have the same last name in the first initial. And uh, so this will, will protect uh, protect for that against that. So the publisher, book title, and so forth. So the data would be a DNA sequence file, that would be an example of data. A cosmic record, does anybody know what cosmic is? So it's a, it's a, it's a somatic uh, variant database, so I'm going to talk about it um, a bit later. Protein-protein uh, interaction data, do you know, you know what that is? We don't talk about it in this course, but so protein, so interaction, so interaction database, intact is a, sort of the biggest one probably at the EBI. And that's a, a, a database where you say protein A interacts with protein B. It's usually protein protein, but they do protein DNA, protein RNA, uh, protein small molecules. And so it's this entity interacts with that entity. And so the record is A binds to B. Uh, you may have more metadata saying where, which part of A binds with which part of B. Um, 
or A binds to B only when B is phosphorylated and so forth. There's all sorts of, of, of metadata you could put around that, but the protein-protein interaction database is, is an example of a record. Titles of a book or, or books themselves. So a storage system could be a box on your shelf. That's a storage system. Uh, Oracle, MySQL are sort of uh, so commercial and, and, and open access uh, uh, relational database systems. Uh, binary files could be a place where you, 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 you just a file system, text files, and, and bookshelves. So a query system could be a list you look at. So I would say you have a list of all the things that are in your bookshelf. And you say, oh, I'm looking for this book, or where is it in my list? And so you can just look down the list, and, and that's sort of a query system. A catalog is a query system. An indexed file is a query system. SQL, structured query language, is a query system. Um, Elasticsearch, which are now used in cloud computing, are systems that allow to look at big data, is another query system. And, and GREP, which is a Unix tool, which you've all practiced last week, right? GREP, yes? OK, good. We'll test you on that later. No? You forgot? You already forgot grep? Grep is a good one. Anyways, we'll, we'll come back to grep later. <laughs> um, and then the information system. So the information system is like the, the whole enchilada. So you could, um, Google is like an information system, right? Uh, the Library of Congress is a library system, is an information system. Entree at NCBI is an information, Ensemble at EBI. USC, UCSC Genome Browser is actually a multiple browsers, multiple organisms. It's a whole sort of information system with the parts talking to each other. And ICGC is also a big information system that we'll talk a bit about today. But so all the, the information system is sort of the, the, the big envelope, the, the ship that you label that has a reference often that you can refer to. Uh, but the but under it, there are many layers of things that are are, are sort of key to understand as well. So NCBI itself allows you a system to submit data, to download data, to, to learn. It has a whole teaching section. It has a whole development and tool section. It has lots of analysis tools and, um, and research and there's places where you talk. The NCBI itself has a core group of, of people that do research and so there's their, their research is available too. So we talked about the DNA sequences and how they're shared and so forth. And actually, the nucleotide sequence are part of this international nucleotide sequence uh, system, shared system, where three centers, so the Europeans, the Americans, and the Japanese, share the, the, the data, the content of, of their respective databases. So there are three points of entry into one database. So you submit sequences submitted either through Europe or Japan or the US, uh, Bethesda.nih at NCBI, ends up into a GenBank ENA, European Nucleotide Archive, or DDBJ DNA Database of Japan, into one repository. And they each issue accession numbers for records that were submitted to them. But let's say a GenBank accession number will be in the ENA database and will be queryable with the same accession number. So it doesn't get a European accession number because it got one already from the US. And so these three databases sort of sync up every night. And so they're actually, within a day, they're the same database of each other. And so it's a really sort of good example of sharing the load of um, submission, updates, and, and maintenance of the archive and, and the, the whole repository across three different countries. It's sort of, and the other sort of benefit there is there, which was not thought about, I think, at the time, was actually you have, basically you have a, a help desk in three different time zones. And so you have, whenever you're awake, you can sort of call somebody to help you. And hopefully, if you're only awake in the middle of the night and you're in North America, you speak some good Japanese and you can call the Japanese people. But, I mean, they all have, of course, they all have email and, and so, you know, and, but there are basically this help a, a, a around the world for this resource. And CBI, of course, has many other things besides sequence data. And so this, if you go to the, um, this query page, you can actually, and you put in the query all filters in square bracket, it gives you the number of records in each uh, resource. And so it gives you an idea of how big uh, 
if you look at previous lecture notes, I have this slide every year, so I, I update it every year. So you can go see how much the, the database is growing, go do that, that exercise, see how, how the, the resources have grown over the years. And so NCBI offers PubMed and PMC, dbGaP, and ClinVar for health data, WGS and RefSeq, an example of the genomic data. They have sequences and 3D structures in the proteins world. They, and they have, in the chemical world, they have PubChem and, and biosystems. So it's just a very sort of quick overview of, of the types of things that they do. Um, and now I'm going to switch uh, a little bit and talk about file formats. And so, and we specifically talk about DNA sequences. And I'm not going to even go, I know, for example, uh, Jared tomorrow is going to go into details of the BAM file format, and I'm not going to do that today, but it's, uh, and VCF, I think also, and he, uh, others later in the week may do VCF files. So you'll have that throughout the week, and all the various file formats that you have to work with. Right now, there's actually, on the UCSC website, there's, um, where the UCSC Genome Browser lives, there's actually a really good sort of uh, table which has definitions of all the various file formats, or many of them that are used in the DNA world and RNA, RNA and DNA, nucleotide world. And uh, I invite you to go look at that if you're interested in that. The databases are now, I've sort of split them, my, I've sort of done that for a few years now, sort of split them into two sort of classes, two categories. One is I call primary or ar archival, and the other one is secondary or curated, although some sort of fit in both sides. And so GenBank is not really curated, although there is some curation that goes on. And curation being sort of uh, what um, uh, Trevor was talking about, the sort of the handwork that has to be done on records that it doesn't, it's hard to automate and, and so forth. And so archival tool, like a resource like GenBank, uh, Uniprot is a protein a resource, uh, PubMed, which is all the you know abstracts, PubMed Central, which is all the open access uh, journal abstracts, uh, Intact is a protein protein interaction database, ICGC, the data for that, EGA is sort of the, it's not sort of, it's the equivalent of dbGaP on the European side. And so then secondary databases where some curation takes place, RefSeq. So RefSeq was actually, in, um, when NCBI was in, uh, invented RefSeq, was a way to take, so, so the issue with the GenBank records is that they're archival and they belong to the user, the submitter that submitted that record. And then uh, NCBI wanted to have a system where they wanted to update those records, and they couldn't update them because they belonged to the submitter. But what they did is they didn't be, but they're part of an open access database. So what they did is they took the best, and also, for example, beta-gal, which is a very common gene in, uh, in, in uh, bacteria, for which there's probably has been sequenced 10,000 times. And so there's 10,000 entries of beta-gal in GenBank. But what, um, we, we at the time wanted to do with RefSeq is to have uh, one copy of everything. So you want to have one copy of the E. coli genome and all the genes therein, one copy of the human genome and all the genes therein, and every organism, mouse and so forth. And so RefSeq is a, is a reference sequence of each organism in a database where, so how does NCBI get that data? Well, basically they go through the existing uh, compendium and they take the best, what they think is the best one, and they annotate it in the best possible way. So they curate it so that, it, and they curate it in a standard way across all organisms and all across, so that it would be annotated the same way. And so RefSeq is really, so if you talk about the mRNA RefSeq sequences that are currently in, in GenBank, or in, not in GenBank, in, at the NCBI, is a copy of every mRNA that for which there is some there is a copy so it exists in, in real life and there is a copy but it references an existing record that was done by some other group and so they've taken from other groups and built a uniform uniformly annotated 
data set from existing stuff that's in GenBank. And so that's RefSeq. And so genes is sort of similarly, it's a curation of all the genes in the various organisms. Taxon is a curation of all the different organisms themselves. Uh, Unibroad, OMIM is online Mendelian inheritance in man. And so it's all the, um, it's basically the, the phenotype data associated with, with all the human uh, genes. And so it's sort of a disease, uh, um, genetic disease associated with all the, the various genes and, and, and so forth. The MODS is a model organism database and ICGC. So why are the MODS so important? So the model organisms databases are so important because that's where all the experiments have been done on mouse, on zebrafish, C. elegans, yeast, and so forth. And so there's a lot of inferences, understanding of what genes do, function, has been done on the model organisms. And then there's homology between the model organism genes and the human genes. And so then you projection of not always correct and sometimes uh, needs to be validated some other way. But there's often, you can sort of speculate on what the function of that gene is in humans when you know what it does in other organisms. And so um, and that's how it's basically the function determined through the mods helps us un understand what it does in humans. And then NAR, the Nucleic Acid, Database, or Nucleic Acid Research Journal, uh, has a yearly uh, database issue that used to every year would sort of publish the top 100 or the top 20 databases that they publish every year. That, and it would be the same ones. And then so a few new ones would get added over time. But what's happened is that that issue got so big, they had to split into two. So there's a few articles which are repeated every year, but most of them is are new ones for that year. So any database that's sort of in um, the in-group gets re-, uh, re uh, published every second year. And so, so if you want to look at all the databases, the top databases in the world, you have to look at two issues worth of NAR this year and last year's. And so in January, every year, there's a new issue. So NCBI, EBI, and DDBJ, and a few others get included every year, but all the other ones get every, included every second year. And so it takes, so for example, this is January 2017, and this is January 2018, you'll have the two issues that cover the last uh, sort of scale of, of, of databases that are, and here we have databases on every topic, so from a lot of cancer stuff, of course, but also nucleot nucleotides, proteins, protein interactions, uh, 3D structures, and, and, and RNA, various types of RNA, and so forth. So I'm just going to spend a couple of slides on talking about GenBank flat file. Um, so I, I used to be, uh, my job, I used to be in charge of, of, of GenBank when I was at NCBI. And it's basically, it, the, the GenBank flat file, it's, it's funny, I was at a conference many, many years ago where they asked, it was a bioinformatics conference, says, how many people have parsed GenBank, as a, have written tools to parse GenBank? Like the whole room rose, rose their head. And the thing is, the GenBank flat file is written in a format not to be parsed. It's meant to be read by humans. It's not meant to be parsed by computers. But of course, there are many people who have, have done this activity over the years to try to uh, um, interpret, uh, to, to store, to have their own copy of, of the GenBank and with, with whatever tools they have. That said, um, whenever you have uh, a gene or an mRNA and things like that or a protein, It'll be represented in GenBank uh, format, and it's, it's useful to understand the sort of the, how this database is organized. So there's a header uh, part, which basically has information that affects the whole record, and so it will be the title of, of, of the record. It will be any publication. It will be the organism, things like that. That affects the whole record. Then there will be features, which are location specific within the within the record, and so there'll be uh, there's a protein from here to there that's encoded. There's a, um, an exon from here to there. There'll be that kind of information. And then there's the, the, the actual DNA sequence. Of course, that's the, what I'm showing here is a format for a, a nucleotide record. There's a GenPEP format also, which is basically the protein version of this, but it's, it's the, same, the same idea apply. 
And the thing to remember about GenMag flat files is that it's, it's meant for humans to read. It's actually very easy to read a uh, GenMag flat file. It's not uh, very easy for a machine to read. And so because there's there's no delimiters, there's a bunch of things that are missing for a machine to be able to, to read this that requires natural language processing to be able to read properly. And so um, it's where people submitted sequences to. Now it's becoming less, it's still an active place where people submit to, but it's less so on the human side because people are actually sequencing the sequencing, human sequencing projects are more whole genome and exomes and, and things like that. And that's a whole different sort of pipeline. It doesn't end up in GenBank, it ends up in other places. And so, so GenBank is less used by that, by human biologists. Everybody else is still heavily uh, dependent and using um, uh, GenBank. Like I mentioned, um, uh, it's a place where RefSeq records are taken from and also genes information is, ta is taken out of GenBank. S small, I'm going to quickly go over the next few slides. There's the sort of the accession number space. So all the accession numbers in GenBank have either a 2 plus 5 or 2, 2 plus 6 or 1 plus 5. So that's a letter and five digits. So one letter plus five digits or two letters plus six digits. And basically, and four plus two plus six now, basically for the whole genome, it's basically they're running out of space. They're using up all the letters, and, and so they have to add letters and, and so forth. This, uh, um, that's sort of the nature of the beast. Um, proteins have a smaller, there's fewer proteins, and so they have a, it's one plus five and three plus five only. And, um, and then RefSeq also have their space, but RefSeq has a different nomenclature, so it's N, a letter, underscore, and then a number. And so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And then now, now as in, it's been about 10 years now, they all have a version number. And so the version number means that if it's version one versus version two, that means version one of an accession number versus version two of the same accession number means it's a different nucleotide sequence. Everything else will be the same except this timestamp. Timestamp will be updated as well. But it means that the sequence is different. So ver version one versus version two means it's a different sequence. It might be one nucleotide difference, or it might be a megabase difference. There is no, that the one versus two doesn't say anything about that. It just tells you that it's a different sequence of the same accession number. So in a paper, you'll have a, a reporting of an accession number, and then it may not have the version number, it should, but it may not have. But then when you look at it, you'll see it's version 1, version 2, version 34, version whatever. And so, and the number, the version changes when the sequence changes. That's all, that's all you need to know. And so, RefSeq, I mentioned, has also different letters. So if it's a C, that's NC underscore or something, that's usually a chromosome. Uh, NM is usually an mRNA, uh, NP is usually a protein, and so forth. And they also have a version. So you'll have NP underscore one two three four five six dot one dot two dot three means it's the first, second, or third version of that protein. When you do a query with just the accession number, the database always reports you the most, the latest version. So that would be the the highest number version. Often it's dot one because most. This may come as a shock to you, but most records in GenBank don't get updated. I know, it's a bit of a shocker. <laughs> but when they do, then you know. And so, um, likewise for RefSeq, if they get updated, and they do, then there's an increase in the version number. Um, there is actually some models, so some of them come from gene prediction, and those are quite r not rare, but they're not as common for a certain organism. And, and then those, that's what those, the X means. Um, the uh, WGS, so actually there's, so, w, so people, uh, Mark referred to that with uh, following the Bermuda, people would submit sequences without doing much work. They would do a first pass assembly, they would get some contig, and then they would submit it to the database. And they would do that sometimes 
as was mentioned, on a 24-hour basis. And so you get a lot of churning, a lot of IDs, and a lot of things happening. And so that's why they invented a new sort of a, a ID space for whole genome sequencing. And, and that's not as common for human as it is for uh, all the other organisms. And there's uh, hundreds of thousands of those. So there's a lot of things in, in GenBank and other. So FASTA files. So yes. Yes. So for when you look it up, you get the most recent. Yes. So is that so the updates happen because you get a better sequence? So there's all sorts of reasons. I, I, I used to have slides in my deck uh, where I actually I was responsible for a version number change. So I discovered a mistake in a record and I emailed it to the database and uh, they fixed the mistake, which meant removing some nucleotides from the record. And then you an increase the so there's an update. Most of the time it's the submitter who's found a mistake and they change they change fix it. Sometimes, although it's not very common, they may fuse two records into one. Uh, and then so you take one of the of the previously existing numbers and you update the version of that one, and then you put the other record as a secondary number so that there's no lose track of that. And that would be important if they knew that the two records actually were one gene. And so they, instead of having one half of one gene in one piece of DNA and the other half in another piece, they decide to merge it. Um, but the most common one, uh, a very common one, would, not as much recently because people are be much better at, at fixing those kinds of things, would be contamination, especially primers or, or vector at the end of sequences that weren't properly snipped away. So they'll just clean those up. Sometimes it's 10 nucleotides, sometimes it's 100, sometimes it's 500. And so the, the records shrink by that much. And so you have to change the, the version number with that as well. OK? OK. So FASTA is a sort of a common file format that's used by the FASTA program, which is a sort of related to uh, BLAST. And so it's a, it's a, it's a rapid. Uh, alignment search tool and uh, but then the FASTA format that was used in the FASTA program became a standard it was so simple that everybody loved it and so it became a standard format for a lot of tools and so a lot of tools use the FASTA format as their input format. Um, this week we'll hear about FASTQ and, and, and other file formats which are derivatives of FASTA and so I don't want to spend too much time on that, but basically you have a greater than sign, you have a bunch of information, and then you have the sequence file. And then if you have, you can do this, you can have 100, 1,000, or 10,000 files, greater than sign, the file name, and then the data, and so forth. And the data, the description can have various structure, and CBI does it one way, and it's actually evolved to how it's doing it. It doesn't use GI numbers anymore, but a FASTA file at, the, at its core is basically greater than sign and then a nucleotide file and or, but not together, but it could also be a protein file. So you can have a FASTA of a protein file or a FASTA of a nucleotide file. And it could be mRNA, DNA, and so forth. Um, so this is respect to some of the articles, the core articles I mentioned in an NAR database issue. And this is a one from uh, NCBI, and they talk about all the various resources. There exist a number of genome browsers out there. Uh, the three popular ones, I would say, is UCSC, Ensemble, and NCBI. And they're in order of preference. I'd say UCSC is the most commonly used one. Um, and Ensemble, sort of 10 times less in NCBI 10 times less, so in, in sort of that order. And then a new one, of course, because we had to do one too, is ICGC. So ICGC also has a genome browser. It sort of uses a lot of the features from the other ones. It didn't totally reinvent everything, but this is um, uh, information about uh, SOD1, which is a, a gene involved in, uh, in, in often mutated in cancer. Um, Best places to look for gene information is probably the NCBI Entrée gene. So there's a gene page which will have all the information about a given gene, who about the gene, the DNA structure, the, all the various transcripts, 
about the proteins, how the, which protein interacts with what, and so forth. So if you go, if you're interested in a given gene, and so on, on the ICGC browser page, there is a link to the entree gene, and so that's just an example. And so you can get more information about about uh, the gene of interest. Another important concept to know about when you're looking at databases and a very sort of important piece of metadata about. Uh, again, something Mark referred to as the reference genome. And so there are, there's a group whose job is to standardize the reference genome. And so for humans, it's actually um, controversial is a big word, and I wouldn't say controversial, but it's a debated issue uh, as to what, what's the best way to reference in, or, okay, 10 minutes, okay, I'm gonna speed up very fast now. Uh, but I like talking. You may have realized I like talking. <laughs> and so this one is important because you need to know which reference you're looking at. And when you're looking at a reference, the challenge is, of course, we're all different. And so we all have a different, different reference genome. And so, and then the first, the original reference genome was actually made by assembling multiple individual genome together. So the reference genome actually does not exist in real life. So it's not a real reference. But that's a bit of a challenge. But there's a website and a group that does reference genomes, and it does has a page for the human reference genome. And if you go to the D ICG, um, UCSC browser, there's a listing of all the various reference genomes they've used. We're going to be using um, HD30, or um, the other name is um, uh, GRC H38, uh, so version 38. Um, and that's the one, and that's already uh, five years old. And so, but it, what you may look, by looking at this table is that initially there were frequent updates and then now the updates are becoming more and more apart. The main reason is the reference we're using is pretty good and to change, to change reference is a big, big job. And so to realign everything to the new reference genome is a big uh, challenge. And I hope, I think, uh, Jared's going to talk about this tomorrow, but there is really, we're, we're really uh, stuck with, with, with our reference genomes in a way. Um, historical perspective in human genome data, I'm going to skip this slide, it refers to some of the things that uh, Mark talked about also, and um, Large number of large scales were done in cancer and, and sequencing lots of genomes turned out to be very useful. And out of that came uh, the fact that we learned that there's a lot of heterogeneity amongst every cancer sample. There's a lot of um, um, abnormalities and, and not just at the nucleotide level, but the rearrangement. And the way you prepare your samples, the way you prepare your samples for your libraries for sequencing and so forth matters a lot. And so out of all that, we decided uh, in 2007 to start the ICGC, the International Cancer Genome Consortium. At the same time, the US was doing the TCGA, the Cancer Genome Atlas, and together, so the TCGA is part of the ICGC, but like I mentioned earlier, there's different access rules. And, but the, but the, the mission is similar in that we wanted to sequence a large scale of genomes to do 500 tumors per tumor type, to do 50 different tumor type, so that's 25,000 tumors, and match with 25,000 uh, normal DNA. So it's 50,000 genomes that was done in, in 10 years, and we're at year nine right now, so it's going to end, uh, it's ending soon. We're not quite at 25,000, but uh, we're almost there. And um, there's needs to be information about the project, the patient, the tumor, the samples, and all of that sort of metadata that's analysis and interpretation. This is a worldwide, so there was um, 18 countries, um, uh, lots of different projects, some countries doing more than one, uh, the US and UK and France and China being examples of countries that have done multiple. We did about three, three different projects in Canada um, and so forth. And it's a map of, of all these various things. 
So this is your typical growth curve. Lots of with time, you'll get enough data. Um, the ICGC homepage has a page, a project page for each of the tumor types and so forth that were done. Uh, you click on it and you can get details about the project. You have information about the data portal, the DACO data access committee, com uh, data access committee, uh, organizing committee, and, and login and so forth. There's a DCC, so data coordinating center, uh, where all the data exists. And um, you can do simple queries, ask for a gene and things like that, or go to specific parts of the portal to help you find uh, things. There are summaries of all the genes, summaries of all, on the left side, there is what we call faceted searches, or facets. So you go and click, and right away, that sort of uh, focuses your query to the data sets you want. And then you can download or, or study further those, those specific data sets. Uh, there's a uh, project entity page, so there'd be like the breast cancer and the various types of breast cancer, there'd be pancreatic, there'll be liver and so forth. So each project has their entity page. There's a um, gene entity page, so each gene will have its own page and it will have a link to the browser, a link to all the various resources for genes. Uh, Reactome, which we're going to talk about later at the end of this workshop, also is integrated into the ICGC page. And each mutation has a single identifier, so you can have, uh, you can uniquely identify a mutation and that's kept from release to release. And so that, uh, that's part of the data model at, at the ICGC so that you'll have, and I mentioned a genome browser as well, and um, ways to uh, access and download the data. I'm sort of going fast because I'm running out of time and I still have a few slides, but it's, um, uh, also ways to download large data sets and so you can download this and actually um, I'll show you in a few seconds on how to download it to a cloud infrastructure. There's also large data sets for example if you want all the open access mutation data on a single file for all of the cancer projects that's available in the portal on the portal as well. And this is some Unixy, Greppy type stuff that you can do, uh, invite you to do on your own. So if you download a file and you can count uh, various, um, how many mutations are in it for a given type, for example. Um, as I mentioned, ICGC is a merger of the ICGC and the TCGA data. Uh, it merges all the open data but not the controlled access data. And the controlled access data is, as Mark referred to earlier, is all the identifiable human data. And so that's exempt from, so TCGA is part of ICGC. They both offer, but they're, uh, they have uh, different tumor types, uh, different uh, definitions of what is controlled access versus not controlled access, and that's kind of important. And, um, uh, different data access rules, different uh, geography rules, and uh, in various countries under a different jurisdiction. So ICGC has rules of what is open and closed. Uh, TCGA has different rules, mostly the same rules, but the big difference is that NIH, so mutations themselves are not identifiable. Right, because they're random across. They're not. They're independent of the germline. Of course, if you have a, a mutation on a germline position, that becomes an identifiable statement because you've just said this one has been modified to where there used to be a germline variant. So those are sort of in a gray zone. But so if if mutations come from exome data. They're considered open access, whether they come from TCGA or ICGC. But if mutations come from whole genome data, if they come from uh, TCGA, that's considered controlled access. If it comes from uh, ICGC, it's considered open access. So why are the same things called open and closed from depending on which country it was made? Basically, the NIH is somewhat paranoid and doesn't trust sequencing, people doing sequencing, and their ability to call a mutation. And they think there's too much leakage of germline variants 
in a whole genome experiment versus a exome experiment. So a whole genome experiment is leakage of germline variants, and therefore that file contains enough germline variants that make it controlled access. You got all that? Yeah? Okay. You can ask me later. So there's a file there which has all the germline variants, but it only has the germline variants from exome from TCGA, exome from ICGC, and whole genome from ICGC. But it does not have variants from whole genome from TCGA. Okay? Uh, similarities, we talked about that earlier, so I'm going to skip over that. You, got, you have to destroy, after you, your period of access to the data, you're supposed to destroy it. So again, the whole concept of destroying what's on your laptop and the ICGC police being able to come over and see that you've actually done it is the audit that uh, was referred to. I don't think it's ever been done, but it's, technically it's allowed to be done, but it's not been done. Uh, Cosmic, we, we talked about, is basically is a repository where all the somatic mutations exist from this project and many other projects as well. So COSMIC is a repository of all somatic mutations from around the world, from around not just whole genome, not just whole exome, but targeted panels and so forth. It's all at COSMIC. And so that's there. And then there's some files at COSMIC that you can go search and, and, and look at and, and see where that data is. So quickly on how to access the data. So as it was mentioned there's a website, you apply, you register, you fill out the form, you press a button, you say, am I ready? Then all the fields are red because you didn't fill them out properly. And then you do it properly, it's all green. And uh, then you get a PDF and you sign this PDF. And basically you sign it by yourself. You sign it, you, you get somebody at your institution that is able to fire you. Should you not obey the rules that are set to by the ICGC, like not data sharing, uh, not re-identifying, and so forth. All those rules you agreed to, that you said you would follow, while well, you get it signed by your person in your institution that can fire you, and so you make sure that you don't break those rules. Uh, then we use uh, currently open IDs, and so that's sort of the whole open ID. You can register, and then once you're in, in um, in the system, you have access to that data. There's a moratorium with respect to publication. The idea is that if it's so many, so much time after the time the data was generated, then it becomes open by default. And it's a, it's a bit complicated rule, but then what we do is we have a list of which ones, which data sets are open and which ones are not. So this is updated at every release. Um, so there's two places I mentioned. So there's dbGaP for TCGA and um, EGA for everybody else. So it's so the non-US data is, lives in Europe. And um, I know I'm, 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 I'm speeding through. <laughs> uh, you'll have to speed through too. <laughs> uh, there's lots of documentation. And quickly, I'm gonna tell you about POG because that's gonna, uh, PCOG, because uh, that's gonna come back um, later this week. It's basically it's pan cancer analysis of whole genomes. So it's we took all the ICGC data sets that had whole genome, which is only a fraction, is about ten percent of the twenty five thousand, so about 20, 2,800, were whole genomes, and then we did a whole analysis on those, to similar to what had been done by the TCGA for exomes. And so these are the leaders of that project: so Peter, Gaddy, Jan, Lincoln, and, and Josh, and um, looked at twenty eight. 100 uh, tumor normal pairs, and some of them had RNA, some of them had epigenomic. You had 17 working groups. A lot right now, a lot of the papers right now, this shows uh, 28, but it's more like 42 now. Are actually, they're all in the publication stage or pre publication, and so they're all the paper, many of the papers are in bioarchive. And this was uh, something I pushed for and, and happened, and so I'm really happy to, to promote here. And will be the first sort of pan cancer analysis of whole genomes with integration of RNA, somatic, simple somatic mutations, copy number variations, methylation, and germline variants. Um, 
all the papers are going to come out of it are all going to be open access papers. All, the, all the, the methods are all going to be in Docker, so you'll be able to use them in, in Docker, and you'll learn about Docker later this week. Um, they're also available in multiple cloud infrastructure. So maybe Amazon's not your thing, maybe you prefer the collaboratory, maybe you prefer another cloud. So there's several options for many of them. And so, um, and Peacock Data has 17, 16 working groups. And so all the working groups have looked at various things and they've all published papers and they're all in the process of publishing papers. Just an example here, I was in a technical working group and we sort of developed the pipelines for the alignment. So we had all the genomes are all aligned through the same way. And it turns out if you align things all the same way, is different than if you each let each group align things uh, each their own way. And so, so we did it all one standard way for, for, for the Peacock project. And it took a long time. A lot of time was moving files around, different clouds across the planet, uh, running various tools. It, it took forever, really. Uh, DocStore will retain, maintain all our Docker containers. And it's, uh, we'll talk more about that this week. And here's information on how to get data and where some of this data is. So the TCGA data now lives at the GDC, the Genome Data Commons at, uh, at the NIH, which is actually, it's not at the NIH, it's in Chicago, but it's a, a trusted partner in the, at the, of the NIH. Uh, the ICGC also data, the non-TCGA ICGC data lives at the Cancer Genome Collaboratory. And so we'll visit that later this week as well. And, and there you have also tools, and there are ways from the ICGC to find out where the data is. And so you have lists of portals, uh, which portal, which data set is at. So the challenge I mentioned earlier today is about uh, getting eyeballs on the data. And you want to try to make things as open as possible, but also you want to respect privacy and confidentiality of the patients. And so a sequence is identifying to, to a patient, be it uh, GWAS or exome or whole genome or RNA-seq for that matter. And uh, it, it has to, one has to be careful on how that data is shared. But if you make a system that makes it too hard for students or students for people to look at, then you don't get anybody looking at the data and then you've wasted a lot of money. So I think we need to support and encourage a culture of sharing openly as much as possible, keeping in line with the various rules. And the consortiums and uh, have done have done a great job of that. Um, as I mentioned, access to data is essential. Getting data that is fair, findable, auditable, and so forth is is also very hard work. Is um, essential to share. Uh, the things that are um, shareable and uh, last message be open so people can see how great you are. It's a very important message. And this are all the sites for ICGC data set. And this is the last slide. I'm actually being nominated for a Benjamin Franklin Award. I need you guys to go vote for me. And so it's a, um, so this slide is not on your slide deck in the printed, uh, book, but it's on the, it'll be on, on the, on the um, GitHub page. And it's basically, uh, if you're on Twitter, oops, sorry, if you're on Twitter, just go to my Twitter place page at, at BFFO, and you'll see a link to, on, for the Benjamin Franklin Award to go vote for me or for somebody else. But vote, please vote. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, we're going to move on. You can ask your question during the coffee break. Yes, um, I'll be around. Okay. I'm here all, all week. So. Okay. Uh, so we're going to move on to the IGV section. Um, we have 20 minutes for 50 slides, so it's going to be kind of quick. Uh, <laughs> but don't worry, there is a hands-on tutorial for this uh, that you can ask more questions in. Okay. Um, so how many of you have used IGV? Okay, it's about half. Okay, so this should be sort of a recap for some of you and brand new for some of you. Uh, so IGV stands for the Integrative Genomics Viewer. It's a desktop application, so you don't need to be on the cloud or anywhere to get it. It's on your own computer. Um, and you can view basically any sort of genomics data on there. So epigenomics, microarrays, uh, next-gen sequencing alignments, RNA sequencing, pretty much anything that's out there, you can put on this and see in a visual way. 
Um, so you can explore your large data sets. Um, you can integrate data sets and clinical data. Uh, and you can also automate tasks. So you can use batch files to have stuff do stuff while you're sleeping, which is really awesome. And that's like the really great thing about bioinformatics. It can happen while you're not at work. Um, you can get data for IGV from pretty much all the, all the places, um, FTP servers, uh, Amazon Web Server, local files, TCGA, genome space. Anywhere you can pull a file in from, you can get it into IGV. Okay, so we're going to go through some basics of IGV just to get you started. Um, there are more things that you can do with IGV that I'm not going to cover today, uh, but this will give you a good grounding on where you can build off of. Okay, so step one would be to launch, launch IGV. So you need to download this from the Broad Institute. Um, there are some buttons on the side, and then you need to select the version of IGV that you would like the most, because they come in different flavors. So you would have to pick the one that matches your needs as well as the space that you have on your computer. So if you pick one that's too large, it's not going to run on your computer, and it's just not going to work. It's not going to be a good day. Um, so once you have downloaded it, and you've installed it on your computer, and you've opened it, you can select your um, genome from the drop-down menu. If you don't see your genome there, you can upload or add a genome that you want, and then you can load data on top of that genome. So for this, it is very, very, very important that the genome that you choose in IGV matches the genome that you have aligned your data to. Because if they don't match, you're not going to see very much or the thing that you're interested in. Okay. Um, so you can load data from a server. So in this example, we're using file, load from server, uh, and then choosing in the server the tutorials there. Um, so what will happen is it will load up your um, the files that you've chosen there. Okay. So basically, the screen layout is going to show you what chromosomes you have, uh, the data that you've loaded, and your reference at the bottom, and all the different references that you load at the bottom as well, which we can see on this one. Um, these are called tracks. Tracks is a fairly common uh, terminology for genomic stuff. Um, and then you have your menus at the top and your toolbar there. And then for the file formats, it's basically uh, any sort of uh, next-gen sequencing file format you can load up there. So basically any sequencing type uh, format that you can think of, it's there. Uh, we'll be using um, BAM files. Um, and that's pretty much it that we're going to be using for this and some yeah okay okay so to view your alignment so once you have chosen your reference sequence and you've loaded up your BAM file uh, you also need a BAM index file uh, you can view your reads there okay so right now you're not really seeing anything because you need to zoom in to see your, your reads so when you are zooming in you'll see these little sort of um, hatch marks and as you zoom in more and more, they get bigger and bigger and bigger. But how far do you need to zoom in to see these alignments? Well, that's kind of a setting that you set yourself. So you can set these settings um, uh, in your options. Um, higher values require more memory. So if you are using like a MacBook Air, do not choose a high value. Um, for low coverage files, it's OK to use these higher values. Um, because there is less data for it to load up. That makes sense? Um, and then for very deep coverage files, so if you are doing, say, the um, circulating um, tumor cells or tumor DNA, uh, where you have uh, 25,000 X coverage, you would want to use a very low value, because otherwise you can't see the stuff, and it would take up ginormous memory on your computer. OK, so once you um, zoom in, um, you're reads will look like this. So you have your reference genome here at the bottom, uh, and the different colors represents your T, C, Gs, and As. Uh, and then you have your reads here. Uh, and then these different colors on the reads are where you have mismatches. So these gray bars here um, are exact alignments, and then the colors are your mismatches. Cool? But you can also change those things, so that, that's not the standard view that you can always see. Um, so OK. Um, structural variation and uh, single nucleotide variants. Um, so important metrics for SNVs is coverage. If you have basically two reads that are covering a spot and one read says it's a mismatch and the other one doesn't, which one do you believe? 
you don't know, right? So you need coverage for that. Um, the amount of support. So how many reads actually have the mismatch? So if you have 50 reads um, covering a spot, one of those reads is a mismatch. Um, you don't have support for that mismatch. Uh, strand bias and PCR artifacts. Is it only on um, a uh, read that's going in one direction, so only your forward reads? If that's happening, that's a problem. Um, and that might be a PCR, or you can also get PCR artifacts. Uh, mapping qualities. Are your mismatches only on poor, poor reads? And also base qualities. Are the mismatches at poor base qualities? And then for structural variance, again, it's coverage, um, insert size, uh, and then read pair orientation. And we'll cover that in a minute. Okay, so again, we have our reference genome here at the bottom. We've zoomed way in. So you can see at the top we have the two colors here, red and blue. The blue matches the expected base, or C. Uh, and then the red ones are these T's here. Uh, and we have lots of support for this and lots of coverage for this. So we would accept that as a um, good quality SNV. Um, you can also color these by uh, which way the read's going. So in this case, we have the reverse reads in blue and the forward ones in red. Um, and we can see in this one that the, the C's, our mismatch, are only on reads that are going in one direction, right? So that would be a problem. So if you're doing um, pair-dense sequencing with Illumina, um, your pairs can give you information about structural events. Are they too far apart? Are they too close together? Um, and also, are they on different chromosomes? That's a big one. Uh, and you can change the, the alignment colors on um, IGV to show you uh, this different information. Um, so does it match the inferred insert size, or is the pair orientation weird? Um, so are most of you familiar with paradigm sequencing? Anyone not familiar with paradigm sequencing? It's okay to put your hand up. Um, okay, so I can go over this really quick. You have your DNA or cDNA. You fragment this, and you have an expected fragment size, but it's a distribution because you have some that are too small, some are too big, but you pick the stuff in the middle. Okay. So when you do this, you get your forward and reverse reads, um, and then what is from the tail end of both is your insert size. But when you align it to the reference, it's also going to be like that as well. So the tail to the tail is your inferred insert size. So your inferred insert size is coming from the reads that you've aligned and not so much from what you have chosen for sequencing. Because uh, the program can't go back and read your mind what you chose. Yeah? Okay, so your inferred insert size can help you um, find deletions and insertions because again, if it's if it's a deletion, they're going to be too close together, and your inferred insert size is going to be small. Um, if they're too far apart, your inferred insert size or your expected inferred insert size can be too large. And then your interchromosomal rearrangements, you're not really going to get an inferred in insert size because they're far too far apart. And how do you measure that? What's the insert size from chromosome 1 to, say, chromosome 8, right? OK, so what is the effect of a deletion on inferred insert size? So we're going to use our reference genome. In our subject, we're going to delete out some stuff in the middle. Um, so the stuff in the middle is gone. This bit is smaller than the bit up there. So what we're expecting is a read to come from here and a read to come from there. Uh, but what we're getting is a read here and a read there. Uh, and then we won't get this big gap in the middle, right? So this is obviously smaller than this. So our inferred insert size is going to be very much greater than expected because our inferred insert size is coming from all the data that we have, all of our reads. Um, and then this size is going to be um, very much smaller than our inferred size. Make sense? So we can color these in IGV. Um, you would have to right-click on your alignments, so right-click in this space. This menu would pop up, color alignments by, insert size. And that will change um, from our gray colors to uh, different colors. Uh, so we can see them here. Uh, these little red boxes here um, have their mates where they're not supposed to be. Uh, and you can see this drop in coverage. So this is your coverage map. You have lots and lots of coverage here. 
and lots and lots of coverage there, but in this middle bit, you don't have as much coverage as you would expect. Okay, so if the insert size was smaller than expected, it's blue, larger than expected is red, uh, and then uh, pairs that map to different chromosomes get really funky color schemes uh, that you'd have to look up. Okay, so rearrangements, where you have stuff from one chromosome on a different chromosome. Um, in the normal, you would look, it looks something like this, and then um, in your tumor sample, you'd have all these little bizarre colors so that you can say that one end is aligning to chromosome one, and we can look all the way on chromosome six, and we have different ends there. Okay. So you can also look at your uh, read pair orientations to say if you have um, inversions, duplications, translocations, or some other complex, really weird rearrangement that can happen in cancer. Um, okay. So for an inversion, this is our reference genome again. Uh, we have point A and point B at the ends that we're expecting. And in our subject, this bit here has been flipped so that B comes before A. Okay. So now when we get a read here in our subject, they would face inward like that. Um, the first read will be where we expect it, and the second read in that pair will actually be on the other end, okay? Uh, and the same would happen with A, so this is what we would get. Uh, we expect this read to be where it's supposed to be, uh, and the other one will go all the way over here. And you can see that the A's, um, they all point in the same direction, and the B's, or sorry, the B section all point in the same direction. And that's not what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to point towards each other. Okay? Uh, okay, so you have the left side pair and the right side pair. And we can find these again by, um, on our alignment here, right clicking, color alignments by, pair orientation. And that will change our colors to what it looks like here. So these ones are all unexpected. Um, pairs. And again, you can see the drops in coverage where those happen. So drops in coverage are usually a bad thing. Okay. Um, this slide just gives sort of a, a color code for what's happening in all these slides, or sorry, in all these really weird things. Uh, and with that, I've reached the end. Mm -hmm.